Suppose on the way home from work today, I drop by a fast food restaurant and get myself a big extra gulp Coca-Cola. Is that a good decision for me to make? Should anybody care whether I buy that size soda or some other size soda? Should society care if my diabetic father-in-law buys an extra gulp on the way home to his condo tomorrow? In the face of a worldwide obesity epidemic, a question I have is, should governments be doing anything to combat the obesity epidemic? I teach a course here at Fuqua on consumer irrationality and market failure. And markets can fail for lots of reasons. Markets can fail because of monopolies, controlling too much of a, a certain product line, say. Markets can fail because of externalities. A company can pollute, and if it's not charged for that pollution, they can basically hoist that, that cost upon society. Markets can also fail, however, by what behavioral economists call internalities. The consumers buying products can make decisions that harm themselves, the consumers. And that's what my course is about. It's about what causes people to make decisions that harm their own best interests, despite having freedom within a marketplace to do whatever they want, and raises questions then about what industry's duties are to protect consumers from their own worst instincts, and when government should step in to protect consumers from themselves. This is a good time to talk about this topic, uh, in part because just on May 30th, 2012, New York City announced it was going to be banning the sale of those extra-sized soft drinks at fast food stores. Is that the government turning into a nanny state? I am a physician. My name is Peter Eubel. I've been here at Fuqua for a couple years now. And my expertise is studying the irrational and unconscious forces that influence the decisions we make. And at Fuqua, I help business students here think about when government needs to step in to protect consumers from their own worst instincts. And I'm going to talk today about how the obesity epidemic can teach us what it means for consumers to make irrational decisions and, and why governments might need to step in. Now, some people would say, right off the bat, I'm crazy because there's nothing like irrational decisions causing people to become obese. Everyone knows what makes them weigh what they weigh. It's how many calories you take in versus how many calories you burn. And indeed, that's caused some libertarian economist types to say that the word overweight is a misnomer that people make a series of conscious decisions about how many bags of potato chips to eat, how many hours of TVs to watch a day, and from that they know how much they're going to weigh, and they choose whatever makes them happiest. I happen to think the word overweight is not a misnomer. I think that our eating decisions are often not decisions, and they're certainly not conscious, rational choices we make. As a physician, I've taken care of many patients who are obese despite their best efforts to lose weight, who because of their obesity are unhealthy and they're spending more time in a hospital than they want to spend in a hospital. They come to me asking me for help to lose weight and they have a hard time doing so. My children now, by some experts' estimation, are living in the first generation in the developed world that will have a shorter life expectancy than their parents because of the obesity epidemic. That raises questions for us as a society, whether we need to step in and do something to prevent people from becoming obese, or at least make it easier for them to make smart choices in their life. So I'm going to look at the temp tension between libertarianism and paternalism through the lens of the obesity epidemic. It starts off with the decisions we make about how much we're going to eat. Decisions I'm now going to try to convince you aren't as conscious or as rational as you might otherwise think. Take dinner tonight. How much are you going to eat? Did you know that part of that depends on how many people you eat with? If you eat at a large dinner table with lots of people, you're going to stay at the dinner table longer because there's such a good conversation going on. Plus, you'll be so energized by the number of people at the table and the amount of conversation going on, you'll stuff yourself with more food without even consciously deciding to. How do I know this is true? Because of an, a randomized trial run in a series of daycares. The researchers, I totally wish I'd done this study, came into a daycare center, and they set kids up during snack time at either a table with two kids at it or tables with eight children at it. They put the same number of crackers in front of every kid, more crackers than they'd probably eat before wanting to get up and run around the playground again, and they let them 
do whatever they wanted. It turns out, in, whether you're at a table with two kids or eight kids, you're at the table for about three minutes total. But if you're at the table with eight children at it, you'll eat 25% more calories. Just energized by the sheer number of children in your social environment, you'll slam those crackers down that much faster. These kids aren't rationally deciding, I want to eat more crackers now. Some thing in their environment has unconsciously influenced them to put more food in their mouths than they otherwise might put. This happens not just in daycare centers. This happens across many domains of our life. If you come to my house for a, for a buffet some night, if I put out my medium-sized dinner plates, you'll eat 25% less than if I put out my large dinner plates. It's hard not to fill up a plate when you're going through the buffet line, and it's even harder not to empty the plate when you're eating later that night. Our eyes often deceive us and have as much to do with what goes into our stomach as the size of our stomach. Brian Wansink, a researcher at Cornell, did a fascinating study where he made a soup bowl that had a plastic tube that went underneath the table hidden from people's view and would refill the bowl with soup. He then arranged for half the people at an evening meal to have the bowl continue to refill, and the other half, it slowly emptied as they ate more. Once again, if you didn't have that eye to cue you into the fact that you, that you were eating so much soup, the amount of soup you'd put away, one man put away a quart of soup without realizing that the bowl hadn't even declined at all. Our eyes often tell us more about what we eat than our stomach, and neither of them are actually making rational decisions. How much we eat then is not merely a matter of conscious choice, but influenced by many factors beyond our awareness. More than, moreover, how food even tastes is influenced by unconscious forces we're unaware of. A business school professor in Houston had people over at his house one night. He was, uh, family was from India, and he was serving mango lassi as a beverage. Many of the people had never heard of that drink before, and so he explained to some of them that the mango lassi was a healthy fruit drink from where his family came from in India, and they all politely nodded, took a couple sips, and didn't think it tasted very good. To the other half of the people, because you see a business school professor can't have a party without running an experiment. For the other half, he told them, mango lassi, yes, it's a very unhealthy fruit drink from where, my, from where my family comes from in India. And those people, of course, loved the mango lassi. That same gentleman, uh, he conducted a more careful experiment where he brought people into his research laboratory, told them he was doing a marketing test, had them taste crackers and tell them how good they were. For half the people, he told them the cracker had two grams of healthy fat the rest was unhealthy fat. That tasted delicious because it had tons of unhealthy fat. For the other people, he told them it was two grams of unhealthy fat, but the majority of the fat was healthy. And they thought it tasted very different. Whether you liked that cracker or not depended on whether you thought the fat in it was healthy or unhealthy. In fact, if you put orange food coloring into an orange juice, that will taste better than orange juice without orange food coloring. If a child takes an apple slice out of a brown paper bag, that won't taste as good as one that he takes out of a brown paper McDonald's bag. So our preconceptions influence how food even tastes to us. When we think something's going to be unhealthy, we think it's going to taste better. So there, how much you eat and what your food even tastes like isn't always a matter of just conscious decisions. That means that a lot of what's happened in our obesity epidemic is food, which has become cheaper, faster to eat and prepare and to clean up, more dense in calories, and frankly, more delicious, more immediate in its pleasures, food that goes right to the dopamine-producing parts of our brain and causes the pleasure centers to light up, uh, has caused many of us to just put more food into our mouths than we know is in our best interests. We have a hard time stopping ourselves. So what can or should society do to combat the obesity epidemic? Well. We don't have to go as far as New York City and ban certain types of foods. That's an extreme measure. And the government has much more it can do between nothing and bans to try to help people make better decisions while still leaving them freedom of choice. For example, the government has had a long history of trying to inform people about consumer choices so that consumers make better choices. In fact, in that sense, you could say government mandates to inform consumers about their choices actually promote free markets by making consumers better informed. 
Now, in another very important domain in my life, cigarette smoking, as a physician, I've taken care of many people who've suffered the consequences of cigarette smoking. The government started an information campaign all the way back into the 60s here in the United States, warning people of the hazards of smoking. When my parents started smoking, they didn't even know it was bad for them. And so this kind of information campaign was very helpful in helping them quit smoking. They knew what choice they were making and what its consequences would be. Now, information campaigns in terms of food, what food is healthy or not, have not been nearly as successful as cigarette campaigns, in part because you can't just say food is always bad. Cigarettes are never good for people's health, but everyone needs to eat to survive. And so the government's tried to educate people about which foods to eat. And frankly, they've done it in a way that's been very hard for consumers to follow. More recently then, governments, especially starting with New York City in the lead again, have been trying to mandate that restaurants provide calorie information to their customers, just like the FDA mandated that for food labels for foods we buy in grocery stores many years ago. Once again, the idea being a better informed consumer can make um, more rational decisions. Now, how well will that kind of an information campaign work? I'm working with a graduate student here at Fuqua, Avni Shah. And Avni designed a menu that she gave to people and asked them to make a choice for tonight's dinner. On the menu, Avni provided two examples of beef dishes, chicken dishes, and seafood dishes for six meals uh, in total. Pictures of the meals, descriptions, and prices were there. And she asked people what they would choose. What they didn't know was that in each of these categories, beef, chicken, and fish, one of the meals was much more high in calories than the other. For half the people, Avni and I then gave people the calorie information so they could be better informed about their choices. And that had no effect, no effect at all on people's eating behavior. The calorie information in isolation did a couple things. One is it, it certainly informed people about calories, but in the absence of telling them what's a healthy amount of calories, which most people don't know. And in addition, it made some people look at this, no doubt, and think, well, I'm getting more calories per dollar. That's a bargain. So just informing consumers about the calorie counts definitely makes them uh, better able to assess their choices. But it may not help them eat more healthily. So what other options do we have? Well, one of the things that the government has to, had to contend with in health campaigns for things like cigarette smoking, and now for trying to combat the obesity epidemic, is the persuasion campaigns being put out by industry to try to convince consumers to use their products. In the tobacco uh, world, this uh, anti-persuasion campaign, or you could say the government trying to persuade people not to engage in certain behaviors, uh, started back in my childhood when Brooke Shields was um, a up-and-coming actress and, and sex symbol, and was brought in to do a public service announcement where she basically said to people, I think smokers are losers. This was a way to keep teenage boys like me at the time from ever thinking of smoking cigarettes. In my case, that was quite effective. Um, the idea being here now that the government is fighting fire with fire. If the industry is persuading people through Joe Camel to pick up cigarettes at an early age, maybe they can put a persuasion campaign to go against it to try to convince people this behavior isn't good. We're seeing in the tobacco wars that the government has stepped that, level, that effort up even more with a recent uh, decision by the Obama administration to put graphic warning labels onto cigarette packages that take up about half of the package, and that include terrible pictures of what might happen to you if you smoke. These campaigns are already going on in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, and Canada. They've had a measurable impact on, on keeping people from starting uh, as smokers. It's currently being battled in the courts right now in the United States for, well, on First Amendment grounds to whether it's limiting tobacco companies' freedom of speech. So that's tobacco. Let's get back to obesity. How do you persuade people not to overeat? We're not going to have a sex symbol come out and say that obese people are losers. We're not going to stigmatize a group of people who are struggling to try to control their weight. So what can we do to persuade? Well, once again, I'm going to tell you um, about an effort the governments uh, around the world are starting to uh, consider, and that is sin taxes, or you could say a fat tax or a sugar tax or a soda tax. In other words, we're going to let people buy or eat whatever they want, but we're going to change the price to try to nudge them towards healthier foods. So again, this worked in tobacco. And when it comes to food, the question is, 
how effective will it be to raise the price of unhealthy food or, on the contrary, to, to subsidize uh, healthy foods so that people will be more likely to eat better foods? Well, Avi Shah, again, working with me, ran an experiment where we gave people that same menu I talked about a minute ago. And in this case, for half the people, we just gave them the menu. For another group of people, we added 17% to the price of the unhealthy foods. And what we found was, as you can see now, there was no change in people's food choices. The 17% increase in price did nothing to dissuade people from eating the unhealthy foods. How could this be? Well, one possibility is that people think more expensive means better. In fact, if you give people a glass of wine to drink from and tell them that it comes from a $10 bottle of wine versus a $100 bottle of wine, you'll find they like the $100 bottle of wine better. Just like taking the apple slices out of the McDonald's bag, your preconception influences the taste of the food. And so if someone's ordering a meal at a restaurant and sees that one is more expensive than the other, they might just assume, oh, that must be really tasty. So rather than dissuade people, you might even encourage them to buy the unhealthy food. No fear. Because Avni ran one more study. In this case, she highlighted to people that that 17% price increase was actually added on to the cost of the meal to reflect the fact that it did not meet local standards for fat and sugar content. And now people were more likely to avoid those unhealthy meals. They saw not only that they were paying extra money, they also saw that those foods were unhealthy. This is one of the lessons that behavioral economics teaches us. And as a physician, I've, I've done much research in behavioral economics to help understand how people make decisions about health and health care. And what behavioral economics teaches us, as apart from traditional economics, is that money and price alone may not be enough to encourage behavior, but instead just a, a, a little symbol, a signal of what's normatively acceptable or some other bit of information that has emotional salience to people can influence their choices. Right now, um, you look underneath your cabinets and you're going to find certain bottles that are labeled as being poisonous. The word poison is enough to inform you about what's poisonous or enough. But when the government came up with a poison label that was shocking and scary, that had a much bigger effect on keeping people away from those uh, hazardous substances and about keeping those substances away from their kids than if there just been the word poison on it. Sometimes persuasion can be very subtle, very simple, but can help people make better choices in their lives. I hope now you see the tension between freedom and well-being that is raised by the obesity epidemic. When we're free to make our own choices, we don't always make choices that are in our best interests. And that's why we need to decide what our government can do, maybe small steps at first, maybe progressing to be more aggressive to combat the obesity epidemic, what we can decide what our government can do to help my kids live even longer than my generation. I'm really glad I grew up in a country that was largely free market, I'm much happier to be growing up in the USA than the USSR. But I, I now recognize that markets, for all their wonders, have their limitations. And one of the greatest limitations is that the markets are a sum of individual choices. And if individuals make enough bad choices, we can harm ourselves. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts.